Section 12 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Carney. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 12. The Baron's Quarry, Part 2, by Edgerton Castle. At first we, the audience, paid her the rare compliment of silence. Then the Baron broke forth into loud applause. Brava! Brava! That was really said con amore, a delicious love song. Delicious, but French. You must sing one of our Slav melodies from Marshfield before you allow us to go and smoke. She started from her reverie with a flush, and after a pause struck slowly a few simple chords, then began one of those strangely sweet yet intensely pathetic Russian airs, which gave one a curious revelation of the profound, endless melancholy lurking in the national mind. "'What do you think of it?' asked the baron of me when it ceased. "'What I have always thought of such music. It is that of a hopeless people, poetical, crushed, and resigned.' He gave a loud laugh. "'Hear the analyst, the psychologue. Why, man, it is a love song. Is it possible that we, uncivilized, our truer realists and our hypercultured western neighbors, have we gone to the root of the matter in our simple way? The baroness got up abruptly. She looked white and spent. There were bister circles round her eyes. I am tired, she said with dry lips. You will excuse me, Mr. Marshfield. I must really go to bed. Go to bed, go to bed, cried her husband gaily. Then, quoting in Russian from the song she had just sung, "'Sleep, my little soft white dove, my little innocent tender lamb!' She hurried from the room. The baron laughed again, and, taking me familiarly by the arm, led me to his own set of apartments for the promised smoke, placed cigars of every description and a Turkish pipe ready to my hand, and a little table on which stood cut-glass flasks and beakers in tempting array. After I had set my cigar with some precautions, I glanced at him over a careless remark, and was startled to see a sudden alteration in his whole look and attitude. "'You will forgive me, Marshfield,' he said as he caught my eye, speaking with spasmodic politeness. "'It is more than probable that I shall have to set out upon this chase I spoke of to-night, and I must now go and change my clothes, that I may be ready to start at any moment. This is the hour when it is most likely these hell-beasts are to be got at. "'You have all you want, I hope.' interrupting an outbreak of ferocity by an effort after his former courtesy. It was curious to watch the man of the world struggling with the primitive man. But, Baron, said I, I do not at all see the fun of sticking at home like this. You know my passion for witnessing everything new, strange, and outlandish. You will surely not refuse me such an opportunity for observation as a midnight wolf raid. I will do my best not to be in the way if you will take me with you. At first it seemed as if he had some difficulty in realizing the drift of my words. He was so engrossed by some inner thought. But as I repeated them, he gave vent to a loud cachination. "'By heaven, I like your spirit!' he exclaimed, clapping me strongly on the shoulder. "'Of course you shall come.' "'You shall,' he repeated, "'and I promise you a sight, a hunt such as you never heard or dreamed of. You will be able to tell them in England the sort of thing we can do here in that line.' such wolves are rare quarry he added looking slyly at me and i have a new plan for getting at them there was a long pause and then there rose in the stillness the unearthly howling of the baron's hounds a cheerful sound which only their owners somewhat loud converse of the evening had kept from becoming excessively obtrusive hark at them the beauties cried he showing his short strong teeth pointed like a dog's in a wide grin of anticipative delight they have been kept on pretty short commons, poor things. They're hungry. By the way, Marshfield, you can sit tight to a horse, I trust. If you were to roll off, you know, these splendid fellows, they would chop you up in a second. They would chop you up, he repeated unctuously. Snap, crunch, gobble, and there would be an end of you. If I could not ride a decent horse without being thrown, I retorted a little stung by his manner, after my recent three months' torture with the guard Cossacks, I should indeed be a hopeless subject. Do not think of frightening me from the exploit, but say frankly if my company would be displeasing. Tut, he said, waving his hand impatiently, it is your affair. I have warned you. Go and get ready if you want to come. Time presses. 
I was determined to be of the fray. My blood was up. I have hinted that the baron's toki had stirred it. I went to my room and hurriedly donned clothes more suitable for rough night work. My last care was to slip into my pockets a brace of double-barreled pistols which formed part of my travelling kit. When I returned I found the baron already booted and spurred, this without metaphor. He was stretched full length on the divan, and did not speak as I came in or even look at me. Chewing an unlit cigar with eyes fixed on the ceiling, he was evidently following some absorbing train of ideas. The silence was profound. Time went by. It grew oppressive. At length, wearied out, I fell over my chibok into a doze filled with puzzling visions, out of which I was awakened with a start. My companion had sprung up very lightly to his feet. In his throat was an odd, half-suppressed cry, gruesome to hear. He stood on tiptoe, with eyes fixed, as though looking through the wall, and I distinctly saw his ears point in the intensity of his listening. After a moment, with hasty, noiseless energy, and without the slightest ceremony, he blew the lamps out, drew back the heavy curtains, and threw the tall window wide open. A rush of icy air, and the bright rays of the moon, Gibbous, I remember, in her third quarter, filled the room. Outside the mist had condensed, and the view was unrestricted over the white plains at the foot of the hill. The baron stood motionless in the open window, callous to the cold, in which, after a minute, I could hardly keep my teeth from chattering, his head bent forward, still listening. I listened, too, with all my ears, but could not catch a sound. Indeed, the silence over the great expanse of snow might have been called awful. Even the dogs were mute. Presently, far, far away, came a faint tinkle of bells, so faint at first that I thought it was but fancy, but then distincter. It was even more eerie than the silence, I thought, though I knew what could come but from some passing sleigh. All at once that ceased, and again my duller senses could perceive nothing, though I saw by my host's craning neck that he was more on the alert than ever. But at last I too heard once more, this time not bells, was as it were, the tread of horses muffled by the snow, intermittent and dull, yet drawing near, and then in the inner silence of the great house it seemed to me I caught the noise of closing doors. But here the hounds, as if suddenly becoming alive to some disturbance, raised the same fearsome concert of yells and barks with which they had greeted my arrival, and listening became useless. I had risen to my feet. My host, turning from the window, seized my shoulder with a fierce grip, and bade me hold my noise. For a second or two I stood motionless under his iron talons, then he released me with an exultant whisper, Now for our chase, and made for the door with a spring. Hastily gulping down a mouthful of arrack from one of the bottles on the table, I followed him, and guided by the sound of his footsteps before me, groped my way through the passages as black as Erebus. After a time, which seemed a long one, a small door was flung open in front, and I saw Kosowski glide into the moonlit courtyard and cross the square. When I too came out, he was disappearing into the gaping darkness of the open stable door, and there I overtook him. A man who seemed to have been sleeping in a corner jumped up at our entrance and led out a horse ready saddled. In obedience to a gruff order from his master, as the latter mounted, he then brought forward another which he had evidently thought to ride himself, and held the stirrup for me. We came delicately forth, and the Cossack hurriedly barred the great door behind us. I caught a glimpse of his worn, scarred face by the moonlight as he peeped after us for a second before shutting himself in. It was stricken with terror. The baron trotted briskly toward the kennels, from whence there was now issuing a truly infernal clangor, and as my steed followed suit of his own accord, I could see how he proceeded dexterously to unbolt the gate without dismounting, while the beasts within dashed themselves against them and tore the ground in their fury of impatience. He smiled as he swung back the barriers at last, and his beauties came forth, seven or eight monstrous brutes, hounds of a kind unknown to me, fulvous and sleek of coat, tall on their legs, square-headed, long-tailed, deep-chested, with terrible jaws slobbering in eagerness. They leaped around and up at us, much to our horses' distaste. Kosowski, still smiling, lashed at them unsparingly with his hunting whip, and they responded not with yells of pain, but with snarls of fury. Managing his restless steed and his cruel whip with consummate ease, my host drove the unruly crew from before him out of the precincts, then halted and bent down from his saddle to examine some slight prints in the snow which led, not the way I had come, but toward what seemed another avenue. In a second or two the hounds were gathered round this spot, their great snake-like tails quivering, nose to the earth, 
yelping with excitement i had some ado to manage my horse and my eyesight was far from being as keen as the baron's but i had then no doubt he had come already upon wolf tracks and i shuddered mentally thinking of those sleigh bells suddenly kosowski raised himself from his strained position under his low fur cap his face with its fixed smile looked scarcely human in the white light and then we broke into a hand canter just as the hounds dashed in a compact body along the trail but we had not gone more than a few hundred yards before they began to falter then straggled stopped and ran back and about with dismal cries it was clear to me they had lost the scent my companion reined in his horse and mine luckily a well-trained brute halted of himself we had reached a bend in a broad avenue of firs and larches and just where we stood and where the hounds ever returned and met nose to nose in frantic conclave the snow was trampled and soiled and a little farther on planed in a great sweep as if by a turning sleigh beyond was a double furrowed track of skates and regular hoof prints leading far away before i had time to reflect upon the bearing of this unexpected interruption kosowski as if suddenly possessed by a devil fell upon the hounds with his whip flogging them upon the new track uttering the while the most savage cries i have ever heard issue from human throat the disappointed beasts were nothing loath to seize upon another trail after a second of hesitation they had understood and were off upon it at a tearing pace we after them at the best speed of our horses some unformed idea that we were going to escort or rescue benighted travellers flickered dimly in my mind as i galloped through the night air but when i managed to approach my companion and call out to him for explanation he only turned half round and grinned at me before us lay now the white plain scintillating under the high moon's rays that light is deceptive i could be sure of nothing upon the wide expanse but of the dark leaping figures of the hounds already spread out in a straggling line some right ahead others just in front of us in a short time also the icy wind cutting my face mercilessly as we increased our pace well nigh blinded me with tears of cold i can hardly realize how long this pursuit after an unseen prey lasted i can only remember that i was getting rather faint with fatigue and ignominiously held on to my pommel when all of a sudden the black outline of a sleigh merged into sight in front of us i rubbed my smarting eyes with my benumbed hand we were gaining upon it second by second two of those hellhounds on the barrens were already within a few leaps of it soon i was able to make out two figures one standing up and urging the horses on with whip and voice the other clinging to the back seat and looking toward us in an attitude of terror a great fear crept into my half-frozen brain were we not bringing deadly danger instead of help to these travellers great god did the baron mean to use them as a bait for his new method of wolf hunting i would have turned upon kosowski with a cry of expostulation or warning but he urging on his hounds as he galloped on their flank howling and gesticulating like a veritable hun passed me by like a flash and all at once i knew marshfield paused for a moment and sent his pale smile round upon his listeners who now showed no signs of sleepiness he knocked the ash from the cigar twisted the latter round in his mouth and added dryly and i confess it seemed to me a little strong even for a baron in the carpathians the travellers were our quarry but the reason why the lord of yanni had turned man-hunter i was yet to learn just then i had to direct my energies to frustrating his plans i used my spurs mercilessly while i drew up even with him i saw the two figures in the sleigh change places he who had hitherto driven now faced back while his companion took the reins there was the pale blue sheen of a revolver barrel under the moonlight followed by a yellow flash and the nearest hound rolled over in the snow with an oath the baron twisted round in his saddle to call up and urge on the remainder my horse had taken fright at the report and dashed irresistibly forward bringing me at once almost level with the fugitives and the next instant the revolver was turned menacingly toward me there was no time to explain my pistol was already drawn and as another of the brutes bounded up almost under my horse's feet i loosed it upon him i must have let off both barrels at once for the weapon flew out of my hand but the hound's back was broken i presume the traveller understood at any rate he did not fire at me in moments of intense excitement like these strangely enough the mind is extraordinarily open to impressions i shall never forget that man's countenance in the sledge as he stood upright and defied us in his mortal danger it was young 
very handsome, the features not distorted, but set into a sort of desperate stony calm, and I knew it beyond all doubt for that of an Englishman. And then I saw his companion. It was the Baron's wife, and I understood why the bells had been removed. It takes a long time to say this. It only required an instant to see it. The loud explosion of my pistol had hardly ceased to ring before the Baron, with a fearful imprecation, was upon me. First he lashed at me with his whip as we tore along side by side, and then I saw him wind the reins round his off arm and bend over, and I felt his angry fingers close tightly on my right foot. The next instant I should have been lifted out of my saddle, but there came another shot from the sledge. The Baron's horse plunged and stumbled, and the Baron, hanging on to my foot with a fierce grip, was wrenched from his seat. His horse, however, was up again immediately, and I was released, and then I caught a confused glimpse of the frightened and wounded animal galloping wildly away to the right, leaving a black track of blood behind him in the snow. His master, entangled in the reins, running with incredible swiftness by his side, and endeavoring to vault back into the saddle. And now came to pass a terrible thing, which in his savage plans my host had doubtless never anticipated. One of the hounds that had during this short check recovered lost ground, coming across this hot trail of blood, turned away from his course, and with a joyous yell darted after the running man. In another instant the remainder of the pack was upon the new scent. As soon as I could stop my horse I tried to turn him in the direction the new chase had taken, but just then, through the night air, over the receding sound of the horse's scamper and the sobbing of the pack in full cry, there came a long scream, and after that a sickening silence. And I knew that somewhere yonder, under the beautiful moonlight, the Baron Kosowski was being devoured by his starving dogs. I looked round, with the sweat on my face, vaguely, and for some human being to share the horror of the moment, and I saw, gliding away, far away in the white distance, the black silhouette of the sledge. Well, said we, in diverse tones of impatience, curiosity or horror, according to our diverse temperaments, as the speaker uncrossed his legs, and gazed at us in mild triumph, with all the air of having said his say, and satisfactorily proved his point. Well, repeated he, what more do you want to know? It will interest you but slightly, I am sure, to hear how I found my way back to the Hof, or how I told as much as I deemed prudent of the evening's gruesome work to the Baron's servants, who, by the way, to my amazement, displayed the profoundest and most unmistakable sorrow at the tidings, and sallied forth, at their head the Cossack who had seen us depart, to seek for his remains. Excuse the unpleasantness of the remark. I fear the dogs must have left very little of him. He had dieted them so carefully. However, since it was to have been a case of chop, crunch, and gobble, as the Baron had it, I preferred that that particular fate should have overtaken him rather than me, or for that matter, either of those two country people of ours in the sledge. Nor am I going to inflict upon you, continued Marshfield, after draining his glass, a full account of my impressions when I found myself once more in that immense, deserted, and stricken house, so luxuriously prepared for the mistress who had fled from it, how I philosophized over all this according to my want, the conjectures I made as to the first acts of the drama, the untold sufferings my countrywoman must have endured for the moment her husband first grew jealous, till she determined on this desperate step as to how and when she had met her lover, how they communicated, and how the baron had discovered the intended flitting in time to concoct his characteristic revenge. One thing you may be sure of, I had no mind to remain at Yanni an hour longer than necessary. I even contrived to get well clear of the neighborhood before the lady's absence was discovered. Luckily for me, or I might have been taxed with connivance, though indeed the simple household did not seem to know what suspicion was, and accepted my account with childlike credence, very typical and very convenient to me at the same time. But how do you know, said one of us, that the man was her lover? He might have been her brother or some other relative. That, said Marshfield, with his little flat laugh, I happen to have ascertained, and curiously enough only a few weeks ago, it was at the play between the acts from my comfortable seat, the first row in the pit. I was looking leisurely around the house when I caught sight of a woman in a box close by whose head was turned from me and who presented the somewhat unusual spectacle of a young neck and shoulders of the most exquisite contour and perfectly gray hair, and not dull gray, but rather of a pleasing tint like frosted silver. 
this aroused my curiosity i brought my glasses to a focus on her and waited patiently till she turned round then i recognized the baroness kosowski and i no longer wondered at the young hair being white yet she looked placid and happy strangely so it seemed to me under the sudden reviving in my memory of such scenes as i have now described but presently i understood further beside her in close attendance was the man of the sledge a handsome fellow with much of a military air about him during the course of the evening as i watched i saw a friend of mine come into the box and at the end i slipped out into the passage to catch him as he came out who is the woman with the white hair i asked then in the fragmentary style approved of by ultra fashionable young men this earnest languid mode of speech presents curious similarities in all languages he told me most charming couple in london awful pretty wasn't she she had been in the guards attache at vienna once they adored each other white hair devilish queer wasn't it suited her somehow and then she had been married to a russian or something somewhere in the wilds and their names were but do you know said marshfield interrupting himself i think i had better let you find that out for yourselves if you care end of section twelve recording by stephen carney